Good morning. I'm Marlita Hempel, and I serve here at Calvary in the Women's Bible Study Group and Communion Serve and the Mentoring Program. This morning I will be reading from Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Mm -hmm. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Marlita. Good morning, Calvary. So good to be with you. My name is Jay Ewing. I usually reside on the Erie campus. I'm pastor of community life there. So good to be with you and see Thornton once again. I just always, time, every time I'm here, I just thank the Lord for how he's answered our prayers here. The community, the friendly faces, the familiar faces, that we serve the same God every week, that we're Calvary this every week, and it's just a joy to be with you this morning. We realize in this series that we are all shaped by something. We are all the products of stories we have lived, things we have bought, people we have shared experiences with, and choices we have made. It's a reality of who we are. We're a collection of stories and people and things, and we are all formed by something. The aim of this series is that we would be people who are formed by Jesus Christ. Now, throughout this series, we've been talking about Sabbath and prayer, I mean, fasting and Bible reading. Uh, There's some great sermons coming your way as well in this series, but we are all formed by something. And so we're our desire as a people of Calvary. If you're new to Calvary, new to this series, our desire is that we are formed by Jesus Christ. And we desire to continue walking in the fullness of Jesus Christ. That is the aim of the Christian life, is to walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ. That is uh, hard to do. And we need some habits and practices, some rhythms in our life that help us uh, walk in that. And so today we're going to look at prayer. As we read in Matthew 6, prayer is so important to us forming, being formed into the image of Jesus Christ. My agenda today is not to teach you how to pray but to form a desire to pray. So often we learn techniques about prayer. We learn from others. We listen to others praying. And we're formed by those, but those are techniques. Sometimes in the Christian life, we're stuck in our prayers, so we read prayer books, and we learn how others have prayed or historical biographies of those saints who are before us who have prayed and how they have prayed. But ultimately, we need a desire to pray a desire to pray, to turn and flee to uh, God in the universe and to have this deep abiding desire. If you're like me, if you're like me, I sometimes can live a whole day and lay in bed at night and think, I haven't prayed once today. Far often, more than I would want to admit to you, that happens in my reality. And so how do we form a desire? What keeps us from praying What keeps us from praying? That's a major question we all need to ask. What keeps us from that fleeing to a God of the universe? When communicating with God, which title do you choose to address them in? That's an important question for how we are formed in prayer and creating a desire. When you think think about God, when you try to communicate to God, which titles do you use? To communicate to him. Jesus reminds us in John 10.10. I think this is a great sort of stopping point once again to say. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. We need to be aware that there's a thief out there who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants nothing else than you to avoid prayer. Nothing else. That's one of his agendas items. And it's important that in Jesus' own words, he reminds us that thief comes to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy. 
He wants to muddle our relationship with God. He wants to distance us from God. But Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. May have life. It's an invitation to step into eternal life with him. That's a, a famous Greek word there in life. That it has an eternal quality to that you, you may as a Christian, as you may as a follower of Jesus, as may a, a, a person who wants to pursue Christ, have life. And not only life, but have it abundantly. I think of uh, Psalm 1 as a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit within its seasons. That we are fruitful in our lives. That we have joy and peace and patience. And that we are people no matter, regardless of the circumstances. Because life is tough, right? It's disappointing. There's failure and disappointments and sufferings. That we may have life within that. And have it abundantly. That's the invitation Jesus gives us. He wants you to have life. Do you believe that? Do you long for life? Prayer is a practice, a habit that shapes the good life with Jesus here and now. It shapes our lives. One of the reasons why our life seems so muted and sometimes so cluttered and sometimes so confusing is that we haven't been praying. We haven't been abiding in Christ. We haven't been living a life that He wants to give. Flinging our desires upon His desires and stepping into life with Him. Jesus gave us a prayer, actually, for this. He says in the Lord's Prayer that we um, can have life. It's a rhythm and a way and a way to believe and a way to pray in which we can have life. The Lord's Prayer. It's a famous prayer. Right there in the middle of Jesus' most important, probably longest and most famous as well, his sermon on the mount. Jesus introduces those who climb the mountain with him. Those who want to be his disciples. He introduces the way in which when how people look within the kingdom of God, what their attitudes are, what their, what their choices are, how to navigate life, how to understand the scriptures. And right in the middle of his most famous sermon, he t- teaches us how to pray. Matthew 6, 9 says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Maybe you've heard this prayer before. Maybe it was knitted and crocheted in your grandparents' restroom, bathroom in their house hung above the toilet, you know, those posters. Maybe it was uh, crocheted in a a blanket or a throw pillow or something within your your rhythms of life. Maybe you've heard uh, other churches pray. Maybe that's sort of the foundation of your prayer. You learned it long ago in Sunday school. Or you heard a dear saint pray this prayer long ago. We might have learned this prayer, but we, we also have this familiarity with it that breeds contentment with it. We sort of just understand it as one of the prayers that Christians prayed. And it breeds contentment. Breeds, okay, great, moving on. This is wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. However, Christians throughout the centuries warn us not to let familiarity dull us to the power of the Lord's Prayer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, the Lord's Prayer is not merely the pattern prayer. It is the way Christians must pray. It is the way in which we must pray. How should we pray? Jesus lays out, we are truly praying to our Father. That's the majority of the sermon, is on one verse and one phrase, our Father. The major reason why we don't pray as much as we know we should and lack the depth in our prayer is that we don't see God as our Father. It's not the pinnacle of our relationship with them. Our Father. Now, it must be said, 
Many of us have uh, baggage with our earthly fathers. Some of us had great fathers that loved the kingdom, loved Jesus, loved their scriptures, taught us how to be in the kingdom, took, brought us to church, were, were influential in our life. Some of us have that. Some of us have good dads who were engaged in our life, who took us to baseball practice or took us to our things, were shown up when we were doing things in school that were just really good dads. Some of us had dads who were emotionally absent. Dads who worked too much. Didn't care that much about what was going on your, in, in your world. Some of us, our dads were just too busy to be interrupted. Angry at times. Some of us had awful fathers. Fathers who might have abandoned us. Abused us. And what Jesus is doing is in here with teaching us how to pray, he's decluttering our view of our Father in heaven based upon our earthly father. That he wants to redefine who we are praying to. And that is part of our, our journey as we live with Jesus, is that we declutter our view of who God is. And he says, pray like this. Our Father. I know it's long, but... Ken Hughes has this wonderful segment about the revolutionary nature of this prayer. He says, The writers of the Old Testament certainly believed in the fatherhood of God, but they saw it mainly in terms of a sovereign creator father. In fact, God is only referred to as father 14 times in the Old Testament's 39 books, and even then rather impersonally. In those 14 occurrences of Father, the term was always used with reference to the nation, not to the individual. You can search from Genesis to Malachi, and you will not find one individual speaking of God as Father. Moreover, in Jesus' day, his contemporaries had so focused on, focused on the sovereignty and the transcendency of God that they were carefully never to repeat his covenant name, Yahweh. So they invented the word Jehovah, a combination of two separate names of God. Thus, the distance from God was well guarded. But when Jesus came on the scene, he addressed God only as Father. He never used anything else. All his, all his prayers addressing God as Father. The Gospels, just four books record his using Father more than 60 times in reference to God. No one had ever in the entirety history of Israel spoken and prayed like Jesus. No one. That first day when they would have heard how Jesus taught them to pray, they would have been shocked. What? You're supposed to use that name in reference to God? Our Father? What is he saying? He's, re, he's redefining. He's redefining their view of God by this. Our Father. The one who's seen God is the one who has the most authority on this matter. Jesus coming from God knows exactly what his title should be. There is no cluttering up his view of God. He sees God as Father. And he invites us to do it as well. The New Testament writers pick this up and says in Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because of the belief of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, we are guaranteed as we confess Him as Lord and Savior to be sons and daughters of the living God. The Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us, guaranteeing us, depositing it on us, never able to take away the ability for us to cry, Abba, Father. Now there is a distinction between our Father and Abba, Father within the New Testament. The distinction is just between Greek and Aramaic. As simple as that. In fact, most scholars believe when Jesus uses Father within the Gospel writings, He's using the word in Aramaic, Abba, because he spoke in Aramaic, but it's translated into the Greek word, Father. In Romans 8, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. This is an invitation. You do not receive the spirit of slavery to look 
fall back into fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Every time we cry, Abba, Father, every time we say, Our Father, the Spirit, the spirit himself bears witness that you and I are children of God. That is our position. That is our delight to be children of God. In fact, addressing God as Father indicates one's spiritual health and positional reality. Let me say that again. One, addressing God as Father indicates one's spiritual health and positional reality. J.I. Packer makes a comment about this idea. He says, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught Everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctly Christian as opposed to merely Jewish, is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. It's the only name for the Christian God. Father. And one of the reasons why we don't pray when we don't have a deep prayer life, is we don't understand our real position. We call him Father. Now, not only does Jesus instruct us how to address God as Father, but throughout the, but throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us who the Father is. I was struck by studying the Sermon on the Mount and the prayer, how often Jesus refers to God the Father in the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually not the Sermon on the Mount. It's the Sermon about who the Father is. Thirteen times out of this sermon, Jesus uses the word Father. Let me point out just a few little indicators of what that means for us as the Sermon on the Mount unfolds. In eight out of the thirteen, Jesus refers to the Father as our Heavenly Father or, or in heaven. What he wants to do is make sure you understand, not only do you have a father, a perfect father, but he resides in heaven. He is supposed to be holy and set apart. He is the foundation of the world. He controls all things. He sees all things. He understands all things. He's not like our earthly father. He knows all things. So he is in heaven. He is a God who is greater than we are, greater than our story, our consequence, our circumstances. Jesus makes this point in the Sermon on the Mount multiple times, eight times, that he is in heaven. It's a beautiful understanding that when we come to the Father, when we come to prayer, we know that he is beyond us, yet he is so near. He is in control, yet he knows exactly what I need. The second interesting thing about the use of Father in the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus assures us that our Father, our Father generously provides good things when we ask. In another section of the Sermon on the Mount, he asks, to ask, seek, and knock. And he says this, he says, a decent earthly father would give you what you would want. How much more then is our Father in heaven giving good gifts? Those that, things that we desire. You know, one of the ways in which this plays out in my family is I have young kids still. We sit around the dinner table occasionally when we have a chance. And the kids have wishes and dreams. I, I promise you, in July, my son is already making his Christmas list up. You know? And recently, in the last season, we had this dopey old trampoline. And my kids were begging us for a new trampoline. And so my invitation was this. Let's pray for it. Let's see what God does with this. And my wife's like, I know you're a pastor, but we, we, God doesn't really, he doesn't care about those things. He has more important things. He has a Middle East crisis. He has a war in Ukraine. He has homeless people and kids who are starving. Why, why would he care about a trampoline? Because our Father in Heaven loves to give good gifts. 
He loves to know what's on your heart. What's the things you're dreaming of and thinking about? He loves to give good gifts. And unlike, and actually like our earthly fathers who maybe have sacrificed plenty of times to put the right shoes on our feet or to show up at places and to provide maybe an education for us and things. This God in heaven, our Father, loves to give good gifts. Just loves it. So you should pray to Him. Tell Him what's those, what are those deep desires? What are those things that you would want? He loves to meet you there when you say, Our Father. The third aspect is Jesus teaches us not to be anxious, which I think is so appropriate in a, the most anxious generation. He says, because our Father knows precisely what we need, not just what we want, but what we need. In fact, in comparison to the Gentiles in this section of Matthew 6, 25 through 32 and 33, he says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Your father knows what you need. He knows what it's going to take for the lights to be turned on tomorrow. He knows what it takes for you to have food on the table tomorrow. He knows what you need. Therefore, don't worry. Because we have a father in heaven. It's amazing to me to think about this in regards to Jesus' teaching that there was these disciples who were basically day to day, mill to mill following him. And never once, never once did they go without. Jesus himself was so dependent upon the Father in his earthly ministry. And he teaches us to pray for our daily bread. Now, you and I don't usually eat bread every day or buy bread, or need bread every day. In fact, we do some Instacart, or we order off of Walmart, and we have plenty. Our pantries are so full that sometimes we don't even want to eat that thing, so we go find something else the night, that same night. I'm notorious for that, saying there's no food in the house when the fruit is out. And my wife's like, there's plenty of food in the house, just not what you want. But our Father knows what we need. He knows what you need. He knows what you need. What it's going to take. And he asks you to step into trusting. And don't worry about tomorrow. Because our Father is in heaven. And he sees the whole landscape of your story. And he knows exactly what you need. Jesus is inviting us to life with him. By understanding who we are praying to. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's inviting us into a, a life with him that is defined by our relationship with our Father. If you want to be like Jesus, if you desire to do the things he did, to live the life he had, to enjoy the presence of God, we must address God as Father. So how do we pray the Lord's Prayer? I didn't, sorry to say, we're not going to give you techniques, but it'd be, be foolish. We need to have some, some learnings on how to pray the Lord's Prayer. After a desire to pray, here's how some ways in which we can pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray it three times a day. Morning, midday, and evening. If you're like me, you need reminders, so I set it on my phone for the right time of the day to go off. Put it on your watch. Put it on your microwave. Whatever it is, remind yourself to stop and pray morning, midday, and evening. This can look like a different for everyone. Whatever our morning is, maybe it's the first sips of our coffee in the stillness of the beautiful Colorado summer morning sun and pray our Father. Maybe at midday you're at work, you're hustling and bustling, you're picking up kids, you're going to this, you're running errands, and you pause Maybe you're in the car, you pull over, safe spot, put it in park, and say that our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Maybe you're at your cubicle, it's a time to pause, and maybe stand up for the first time since you sat down. Do a lap around the cubicle, turn off the screen, take a few deep breaths, and pray, our Father. In the evening time, maybe it's the time where you gather with your family. Pray it around the dinner table. 
Maybe do it old school way and just kneel before your bed before you go to get into it. I mean, that is old school these days. And pray, our Father. I am encouraging the Thornton campus this week, like I encourage the Erie campus this week, that we would commit this week to praying the Our Father morning, midday, and evening. It is life-shaping and life-shifting. I picked this practice up in, in COVID, praying the Lord's Prayer. And it has been foundational, foundational to my formation and my trust because we pray to a God. We pray to a God that who's in heaven. We pray to a God who loves to give good gifts. We pray to a God who knows what we need. Therefore, each day, I pray our Father. Pray the Lord's Prayer with others. When it shows up at Calvary in the service, just be so delighted to pray the Father because it's our Father. It's not an individual journey. It's a collective journey of understanding, of decluttering, of encouraging one another who our Father is. So pray it together in community. Pray it at your life group occasionally. Pray it at your Bible study. Pray it with your friends or you know, maybe on a vacation with them. Stop and pray the Our Father. Pray it with your family. If you've been given the gift of young children in this season of life, teach them how to pray. If you've been given the gift of grandchildren, teach them how to pray. Don't miss out on the opportunity to teach them how to pray. We learn from those who lead us, from those who are in authority of us. Teach us how to pray. If you have high schoolers and you've never done this before, teach them how to pray. If you have college students coming back from home, teach them how to pray. If you have grown up adult children who come to visit, teach them how to pray. Pray with your family. In my life, this looks very simple. It's right before bedtime. The kids, you know, sometimes it's like herding cats to get them to bed. Sometimes it's like herding baboons, right? You just want to get them there. And we do this right as we put on the covers and we turn off the lights and we pray our Father with them. It is amazing. It's been so instructional to my heart to see what they speed up on, what they emphasize in the prayer. It's a beautiful thing to be there. And they're actually teaching me to pray. There's been times of in hurry and haste, I walked out of the room and my son's like, Dad, we haven't prayed yet. Yes, let's go pray. Yes, yes, yes. Our Father. Teach your family members how to pray. Teach it at Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, 4th of July. It's a joy to be in a family that loves the Lord, whose heart's tuned to it. It's one of the gifts that the Lord has provided for me. And we pray it together at those meals. It's either the Lord's Prayer or the doxology is sung, depending on which season it is in. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. I didn't say this in first hour, but you do need to read books on prayer. You need to read spiritual biographies of great saints who had wonderful prayer lives because it's so encouraging for you. It's not a burden to say, oh gosh, look at them. They can, I can never be that. It's an encouragement to you to say, oh yes, this is part of my, my story with Christ, is to pray. Teach us to pray. Sometimes we pray the Lord's, how do we pray the Lord's Prayer? Sometimes we don't pray the Lord's Prayer. I have made a case why we should pray the Lord's Prayer, but sometimes we don't need to pray the Lord's Prayer. It's not fitting in the moment. Said, pray, Lord have mercy. When you get that phone call and hear that tragic news, or you hear about a friend who's going through a really hard time, Lord, have mercy. Sometimes the Psalm 23 is a better prayer. The Lord is my shepherd. To memorize that, that Psalm, Psalm 23, that most famous Psalm, and pray that. Sometimes prayers like, Jesus, help me. That's all I can get out. Maybe it's a coworker who walks in and tells you something tragic. And all you can do in that moment is like, Jesus, help me. 
It's like deer in the headlight type prayers. Like, I'm in trouble. This is hard. I need you to help me. Immediate, fast, quick, help me. A few years ago, I learned this prayer, the do it prayer. It was a season of ministry and life. I've been with these guys for nine years. My Thursday morning Bible study. We meet at 6.15 in the morning. And often we, we have these themes and studies of books of the Bible. And we had just finished up the armor of God. And as we were wrapping up the morning, knew he was sort of wrapping and getting our stuff. One of the guys said, hey, I, got, I, need some to, I need some time to tell you something. And that's not unfamiliar for us. We, we usually do give each other life updates at the end. He says, I just found out in the last two days that I have a brain tumor. And we were shocked. The room was silent. We didn't know what to say or do. The disappointment had hit our hearts. The anger, the frustration, the why, what to think. So we did what we all do when we have these things in our men's group. We said, let's pray together. Now, I'm the professional Christian in the room, and I had no desire to pray at that moment. No, no idea how to pray at that moment. With this news, with this friend, this, this guy I love, with this diagnosis, like there's no way I want to pray. But some of the guys started, and we listened, and we pleaded, and we prayed. In fact, one of the guys in the room who's been praying way longer than I have, many more decades than I had, started saying this phrase, do it. Lord, do it. Father, do it. You can heal him. You can save him. You can do it. Do it. And he was getting angry as he was doing this. And I remember as a collective, as a one, one unit together, one community, we were like, yes, just do it. Just do it. Sometimes those prayers are the most powerful and appropriate in the moment. The do it prayers. We know your desire, God. Do it. We know your will. Do it. Heal this man. Do it, do it, and do it. And as that day resided, and as we said amen, we believed together that God could do it. And I was instructed on how to pray. So, I can't think of a better thing to do than to say the Lord's Prayer together now. So I'm going to invite the band back up. I want us to take a moment, pause in our day, and we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. You want to stand with me as we do this? Pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of those debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. Thanks for joining us for our summer series, Formed. If you found this video helpful, click the like button and subscribe to our channel. It helps more people discover resources like this from Calvary Bible Church. Learn more about us at calvarybible.com and join us again next week as we seek to become more like Jesus.